Monday Talkers, welcome back again to another episode of Monday Talks. Today, we are thrilled to have Mustafa Ham. How are you, Mustafa? Hi, Daniel. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you all the way from Australia to here to the Middle East. Mustafa is the best-selling author, globally recognized mindset coach, and a true expert in helping people reignite their passion and achieve success. So thank you again, Mustafa, for joining us. It's really exciting to be on your show. I know we've been trying to make this happen since last year, so I'm really glad we finally made it work. As long as it went fine, then yeah, let's go. Let's do it. Before we go, let's have a, an ask. You know, every subscription, every like, every share means the world to us. It's not numbers. It's about incredible community we're trying to build together. So if you haven't already, please make sure to hit uh, subscribe, drop a like, and share this with your friends. It's more than just a support. It's a journey we are taking together to spread these great minds and their even greater stories. All right, let's get started by saying Mustafa. Who is Mustafa? Wow, very deep question. I can write a book then. <laughs> you uh, do that. <laughs> so look, I mean, I'll try to give you a bit of a narrative of, you know, what I do, where I came from, my background and all of that in as short as possible. I'm Syrian by birth, lived in a lot of countries. I grew up in Saudi, studied in Jordan, Egypt, lived in Lebanon, India, Uzbekistan. Dubai is probably where I spent the biggest chunk of my life, about 20 years. I started my career in uh, as a telesales sales operator from there moved to become a PR guy. I was handling the PR for Nokia in the Middle East and Nokia from there, I handled all the nightlife events access. So you can imagine how my life went, especially back in the days. I think you're as bold as I am. So we're old enough to remember what a Nokia <laughs> is. And you know, Nokia had the yeah. biggest marketing budget in anywhere in the world, and especially in the Middle East. So I was the PR guy for that, ha having access to all nightlife and events became one of the most popular guys in Dubai because of all the party access that I had in events. I left eventually the company that I was working for and opened up my own agency, took it from four people to 45 people, multi-million dollar turnover, and then wow. got into nightlife events, clubs, things like that. And my partners at that time opened what used to be the Cavalli Club. And from there, you can imagine how my life was. Outside was very shiny inside very empty, woke up one day, not happy with my life, bought a one-way ticket to India. So that's kind of the journey, at least from the, I'd say what prehistoric of the transformation up until that point. Well, uh, can I say a global citizen, like you mentioned so many countries in the map of your story, and you started from Syria all over the Dubai, now you're Australia and take it to India. Was it challenging or was it like you enjoyed the requirement? Very interesting. I mean, in context of things that I do, I would say was not easy at that time. And it's one of those things that I talk about in my recent book, which I would will talk about later. But that whole mindset at a point of time that all of those things were some of the worst things that have ever happened in my life. For a kid, you can imagine you need time to form friendships and you need to bond over time. And I was moving schools, even if not countries in the same country, I'd move schools every one to two years. Many reasons, family financial situations, sometimes up, sometimes down. So sometimes I'm upgraded in schools and sometimes I'm downgraded. Reality is I never stayed long enough in a school to have friends. So I'd move schools, then I move countries, then I move another country. And that naturally meant my people skills did not develop in a certain way. Even with sports, mm -hmm. I was the guy that nobody wanted in a football team. Literally, I'm like, hey, me, 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 me. And by the end, when they choose me, oh, oh, we have this guy. So I'm like, I didn't even know how to play Goal ball. Keeper. Literally, I'm the guy who nobody knew how to play. Well, actually the reserve, <laughs> not the, even the goalkeeper. <laughs> so I was, so, but that naturally taught me a lot of other things, which I didn't appreciate at that time. So over time, what started happening is I started also learning to be very adaptable because mm -hmm. I had to learn to figure out people very quickly. I had to read people very quickly. I had to be able to determine, you know, friend or foe very quickly uh, and determine how can I add value and exchange value and move on with that. And some of those relationships, while they might not be quantitative in numbers, 
Although like in the nightlife and events, you can imagine the surroundings that you have and the entourage and all of that. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about genuine human relations. The ones that I develop generally are very deep and very strong because they go very deep because of the experiences of filtering through. So that was a long answer to your question about the whole experience. Yeah, not just Mustafa, the part about, okay, well, how did I find that hard or easy on me? It was hard in the short term, but as I reflect, it made me who I am. And now, yes, I am a global citizen because that, that life was mostly Middle East from kind of generally the countries that I lived in. But as I now left Dubai about 2020, not fully, I basically, tra Dubai is one of the destinations I spend a decent amount of time in, but I live in between Dubai, Melbourne, and soon enough, uh, Bali. So I'll be Melbourne, Dubai, Bali as a base. And then I use the base that I'm in Bali. to give me access <laughs> to different destinations. So the global citizen element of it and how hard was it? It looked hard and I was really depressed about it for a period until I realized that that's the thing that prepared me now to be able to live such a global nomad and executive nomad life. Let's talk about your book, Sling Chat. Yeah, let me just... Promises put... to help readers. Yeah, that, I believe you promised there to help readers heal their past, master their mindset and ultimately launch themselves towards brighter future. That's a big promise. Big talk. That's big a talk. powerful promise. Let's see if I can walk the talk. Can you give us a bit of, about what inspired you to write the book first? Well, that will take me to the continuation of my story. So that was up until I before I bought a one-way ticket to India and then during the few years before I bought a one-way to India, I was going on a journey of search, soul search, like a lot of your listeners. We're just trying to be better people, improve ourselves, learn and grow. And then what started happening is I would go to kind of the, the coaching space, which was all about go, go, go. It's in all in the mind, mind over matter. You can make things happen. But I was trying my best and something wasn't working. I'm sure you resonate with that as much as a lot of you know your listeners is like, you really do your best, but something is not working. And it's not a glass ceiling because a glass ceiling, sometimes a stubborn person like me would shatter through. You just keep pushing till you break it. It's just something that is more like a, a string pulling me back. So I go, go, go. It's a rubber band. You go, 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 go. And then it snaps you back and you run, 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 run. And then it snaps you back. And I'm like, listen, I can't deny those feelings. So I went into the world of healing. In the world of healing, I ended up digging deeper and deeper and deeper. And guess what happens the, dig the deeper you dig? The deeper you dig, the deeper the hole goes. And then you can never dig yourself out of it because I would go and solve one problem only to find two problems under it. And then I dig deeper only to find two problems. You got stuck. And then I got stuck and I'm like, there's a problem here because this was the future, future, future wasn't serving me, past, past, past wasn't serving me. And I realized there's an inherent problem or a challenge with the self-help industry is that it is generally unipolar because it either focuses on this or that and i want to be careful in what i say here but i want to be honest to serve the listeners is there's also an inherent benefit to some of the people in the industry because that means you come back for more that means if you if you go for a healing workshop and that doesn't solve a problem and only uncovers two now you need level two and now you need level three and now you need level four and you're always upsold 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 can we dig here deeper when i it's a whole book there yeah. But let's get a specific tip or a technique viewers can try now at home to begin with, like letting go of past baggage or throwing out the past behind their back or what can they do now as a practical tip. I'll give you the overall premise of the book and how to do it. And then I'll give you two steps to execute that. Okay. So, and I'll tell you why, because this book is about rewriting the story of your life. It's not about one fix. And this is why I said, we'll see if I'll walk the talk. I'm not promising you a one time fix. I am promising you a system that will help you figure out a way to deal with your stuff and not once on continuous basis, because dealing with your issues is like brushing your teeth. Is one time enough? If anybody tells you that they're lying to you. And if I tell you this is a one time fix that you're never going to need anything after, I'm lying to you. Don't, don't believe me or anybody else who tells you that. You need to brush your teeth day in, day out. You go to a dentist and get a teeth whitening, fine. But if you don't brush every day, it's going to go. So I'm going to mm -hmm. give you the concept, which is around rewriting your story. Okay. So this whole book, mm -hmm. if I'd summarize it, it's about rewriting the story of your life. I wrote the story of my life as I moved from different countries and this, and I could never make friends and I was lonely and I had no people skills. And, I, and when I rewrote the story, I'm adaptable. Uh, I can survive. I can read people. 
the process yeah. starts with first identifying, and I'll ask you as much as I'll ask everybody listening, if your life was a movie, what genre would it be? So ask yourself mm -hmm. if your life was, a, reflect on your life in whatever story you see now and go, okay, what genre is the movie of my life? Second thing is, what would you call that movie? So put a name to it. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then start writing that story. My life is, so I'll give you an, a real example. This is me being vulnerable and open here is at the down point of my life after my whole journey of India, coming back, becoming a speaker, all of these things and going through those challenges, which eventually led me to write the book. Okay. Is I would sit down and I was in Dubai, I'd go somewhere I remember on in Jumeirah Beach and around sunset time, I'm sitting there and kind of, oh, my life, you know, I've done my things working and I'm sobbing. And, and at that time, literally in my head, this is where this analogy came from. I'm like, my life is a sad movie and the title of my movie, Dreams Broken on the Shores of Reality, because I'd see the waves hitting and I'd imagine my dreams all shattering. So that was the real... Honestly, the name of the movie Romantic in my name, by the way. <laughs> very sad romance, sad drama actually is the genre. So the movie of my life was sad drama and it was called Dreams Broken on the Shores of Reality. And the story was my life failed because I never got a decent education because I didn't speak good English when I came and I never went to a proper university. It's because my dad interfered in my life and it's because this person did this to me. And I was sobbing about all the things that went wrong in my life. And I wrote that story. And then over time, I started rewriting that story. And because of that rewriting process, which is now because we don't have the time. So the book actually takes you through one exercise to the next, one exercise to the next. I rewrote the story and suddenly the story of my life was, I'm actually very adaptable. You can put me in any country, anytime, and I could restart my career from scratch and I will be the top in my field in less than a year. That skill took me actually so many breaking points to be able to rebuild myself and learn how to build my myself consistently, be able to read people quickly, build and form relationships quickly. So it changed who I am. And suddenly the title of my movie and the genre became the genre became an adventure and the title of my movie, A Life to Die For. Wow. Wow. Let's explore more. How can someone identify what's holding them back? Like you said on the beach and you discovered that if you don't speak to yourself, you will not find that your adaptation skill is very powerful. Very good question. I, I think, look, I talk about in my book, I say that this system will not work for you or anybody who wants to go through it unless you have three things, okay? And the umbrella of those three things is 100% ownership of your life. It's just not gonna work. Mm -hmm. If the position is pointing fingers at people, my father, the history, the culture, the family, the nationality, nothing, I, nobody can change anything because you're always pointing the reason outside. So when we do this, mm -hmm. Only then that ownership starts the journey and th that has three cornerstones. One is courage. Courage is not courage actually to go at something. It's actually courage to look in the mirror and face yourself and be truthful and brutally honest. That is real courage. Outwards courage is easy. People think outwards courage is about doing crazy things. That's like, I'm a skydiver and a motor racer and I do adventure. That's not the courage. The courage is actually face ourselves in the mirror and be brutally honest about who we are because we build an image and we try to live up to that image when the truth is not that. So courage yeah. is one aspect. Second is humility, which is to say, okay, now I'm courageous enough to look in the mirror and go, maybe I am not who I thought I was. Number two, humility is to put your hands up and say, I really need help. Like I'm Mustafa and I'm having ch mental challenges. I need somebody to help me. I'm Mustafa. I don't know what to do with X, Y, Z. You need to put your hand up and be enough humbleness and humility, not to think you're better than the person who needs to ask help. And third one is discipline because you can see the problem. You can say, I need help, but somebody gives you the medicine and you don't take it as much as if you don't show up to the gym and do the work, nothing's going to change in your life. So for this system to work, you need ownership, which is demonstrated by courage, humility, and discipline. The past, you mentioned the past. Let's say, what are some common myths or misconceptions about dealing with the past? Beautiful question. Misconceptions about dealing with the past. The past, in a way, 
is important in building and bringing who we are. And there are two <laughs> things that are detailed in the book of why people hold on to the past, okay? One is if you actually forgive and forget someone, let's say somebody did you wrong. This because I'm not denying that there are people who might have done me wrong along that journey. Whether I hold them as the reason for everything wrong in my life, that's a different conversation. So there are just factors and they've been... Yeah, but it's a tough dilemma what you just said now, because one part is mm -hmm. I have to live with the results of that, okay? But part two, it is the past and I can't change it. So now mm -hmm. you have a dilemma that we actually have to deal with of what is it that actually, how do we handle that? And the first thing is to actually understand if we let go of that negative thought of the past, we're not actually letting, saying that it's okay. I'll use an extreme example just to, to bring the context. Let's say somebody, I'm passing by a street and somebody hits me with a car and that because of that I, I lose mobility or I end up losing a body part or I end up being injured permanently for the rest of my life. Now, I cannot change that. I have to live with it, but I cannot change also the fact that suddenly something was taken away from me. That's too much of an ask to say that, you know, ignore that, fine, but like no, that's easier said than done theoretically. So then what do you do? You can't do either or. You can't forget. So forgive and forget is stupid because if you actually mm -hmm. forgive and forget, you're going to make the same mistake again. So what you do mm -hmm. is you forgive by letting go of that, saying that, Although I do not agree to the actions of that person because I do not want to make their actions okay because what they did is wrong. But I'm choosing to forgive because that relieves me from the burden on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. Then I separate. That's a term I learned in consulting. That's the terminology I learned in consulting because they have a word called decoupling. It's a beautiful word. It was, it was an aha moment. Like sometimes you're trying to solve a problem that has two things and you can't solve it. So when you decouple them, you say, I say okay to this, but I don't say okay to that. I say okay to let go, but I don't say okay to the fact that this person hurt me. This, it's not okay for this person to hurt me because they should not hurt other people. But it's okay for me to let go of that trauma in my life. And the second thing about the past is that we hold on to our past because the past generally justifies the actions we take. Because if somebody mm -hmm. did something to me, then because of that, I took other actions and other actions and other actions, or maybe because of a perception in my mind about where the world is and what life is. So we end up making decisions accordingly. And because of that, it's very hard to let go of that story because if you built your life on that fact and you take away that story, guess what? what's going to happen? All of that story collapses, which means sometimes I'll look at myself and go, I was stupid. <laughs> it's like, it's not fun. That's not fun. Nobody wants to look back and go, I was stupid. That, that will take us to, to another step, which is like the mindset. Mm -hmm. mastering your mindset, right? Yeah. You talked about this in your book. There's something you mentioned, the monkey ladder. Yes. Right? Yeah. Cool. This technique, can we elaborate more about and how it can help our viewers from self-limiting beliefs? Beautiful. So you're going to allow me a bit of space because I have to tell the story of the monkey ladder first. Because now you said monkey ladder and people yeah, are course. thinking, people thinking, what's, the, what's the monkey ladder? Yeah. So this is actually a scientific experiment. It's a bit tricky because it is a scientific experiment, but it wasn't actual like monkeys, but it was accredited in journals. It was a published scientific experiment in journals. So what it is, there are five monkeys. Okay. They put them in a room. They put a ladder and they put bananas on top. And the monkeys would obviously run up wanting to grab the bananas. They get a, a hose, a strong water hose, like the one they use the firefighters, and they hose them down very strongly, like a form of punishment for attempting to grab the bananas. So after a few times, the monkeys learned, no, 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 no go. Because if you go up there, you get hosed down. You fall down and you, you know, it wasn't fun. So then the monkeys would not do anything. They took out one of the five monkeys and put in a brand new monkey. That monkey started running up the ladder because he saw bananas. Guess what happened next? The four other monkeys, mm -hmm. the four other monkeys stopped that monkey from doing it. Oh. That monkey didn't get hosed down. That monkey didn't hose down because those monkeys learned the lesson that this is a no-go zone. So four monkeys, new one new monkey tries to go up. They go attack him and beat him up because no, 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 no good, no good. Monkey down. They start taking another monkey, bring another monkey in. Same thing happened. At the end, all five monkeys were replaced. They brought another monkey, put him in. The four monkeys would beat that monkey down. Although those new monkeys, none of them was hosed down. Oh, 
To understand what happened is is a cultural programming. This is what you and me and anybody who's listening, asking ourselves and going, I am not doing because I was told not to do, but I don't really think and understand why. It's just somebody Mm -hmm. told you. It's, it's, a, it's a belief about something that somebody told you you should do or you should not do. And this starts really early on in life with parental conditioning and cultural conditioning and community conditioning and friendship conditioning. And if you see now back, as whatever it is, and I'm not saying it's good or bad, I'm just telling you those things define you sometimes without you actually knowing what they are. That's a very important aspect over here to think of. So that's the monkey ladder story. Okay, that's the monkey ladder story. So the question is, How do we break away from the monkey ladder that we're stuck from that analogy of, hold on, maybe we are programmed, okay? Maybe we are programmed by our parents and by our culture and by our friends to do certain things in a certain way. So what you got to do is, again, another exercise from the book is you actually grab a piece of paper and you identify the limiting beliefs. And those are categorized, okay? There are limiting beliefs about the world in general, okay? And there are limiting beliefs about the community and the society or the group around you. And there are limiting beliefs about yourself. So I'll give Mm -hmm. you an example. You just think big impacts the whole world. So if you're saying... I have a limiting belief about the world that there was a, a belief. If you look back at some of the videos on social media about, for example, running, there was a, the, if you look at gymnastics in the Olympics, 50, 60, 70 mm-hmm. years ago, it looks like a child play now because there's a limiting belief that nobody can ever break that until somebody breaks that barrier. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you think about, I can't remember the name of the lady that went on a bus in the U S when African were not allowed on the bus mm-hmm. and then she mm-hmm. refused to get off that chair so there was a limiting belief that was programmed because that was instructional that was by law and then that started the revolution that created the movement of freedom which eventually then you have a guy who stood up there and said i have a dream malcolm x you know Uh, sorry martin luther king yeah Yeah. Martin Uh, martin luther king and then that naturally started breaking those beliefs. So you really got to start looking at those beliefs. Another limiting belief would be women cannot, okay? A woman cannot do X, Y, Z. What about one stronger one? The self-talk, you know, this is the biggest force. What I'm trying to explain to you though, is you got to understand is trying to change your self-limiting belief without changing the bigger limiting belief doesn't really work because you are constrained in a community. Yeah, you are constrained in a life. So if you are raised, I mean, today in digital world is much easier. Okay. But I'll give you a small example here. I was coaching, I was flown in to coach some person, okay, who's a teenager and his dad paid me to help him find his passion. And I actually found that his passion clearly guaranteed was that he's a chef. This guy was made to be the next Gordon Ramsay, this genius. And he was still 16. You know what's his dad answer when I went back to the dad? He said, over my dead body, my son works in the kitchen. Mm. Limiting belief about what? Men do not work in the kitchen. So that father, Mm. The son has a dilemma because the son wants to make daddy proud and daddy's financing that, and especially in a Middle Eastern culture, in an Arab culture, because that's a much stronger bond than in a Western culture. So now you've got the whole Arab culture and then you've got the communities, the specific country, and you've got that specific family. So if you try to go to that person and try to take the limiting belief out, you have a bigger dilemma that he's got, I'm going to disappoint my dad. So to Mm -hmm. untangle that, first we have to dismantle multi layers. One of them is men can work in the kitchen and they can be successful. And you look at somebody like Gordon Ramsay, I think what 200 plus million net worth and he's a chef. Mm -hmm. I don't think that father Mm -hmm. would be upset if his son ended up that way. But the limiting belief was more cultural because he belonged to a very strong Arab community where that conversation at that time was unacceptable. You know, it was it was a downgrade in the community. Let's take this to another dimension, close question. When we talk to ourselves, can this talk, negative talk, be helpful for us to change this mindset into growing? Beautiful question also. Look, negative talk has its place. Fear, fear by itself has its place. Because also if you take it the other extreme, I'll use extreme sports that I do. I jump out of airplanes. Okay, I'm a skydiver or I was at least till I injured myself. If I didn't have a healthy, until if I didn't have a healthy level of fear to make me understand that I'm risking my life every time I jump out of a plane, to make me use that fear to double, triple and quadruple check on my parachute, that wouldn't be very smart. 
So a healthy dose of fear is useful because it keeps us in check and we don't get too eluded to think we're Superman and just jump without doing all the checks. How many times did you jump? I uh, 49 and I slipped a disc in my neck, so I can't do it anymore. 49 solo. 49. Yeah, that's called B license, basically. 50 at 50, you become a B license. So solo, that's separate from the tandem. But yeah, so that's a healthy level of fear. And because of that fear, I'm still alive. Yeah, I injured myself, but I'm still alive. Versus somebody who and might not have that fear. You have, you have to face the same fear, is um, it? Or... You get more, more skilled, or you get more skilled. Yeah, look, it's like anything else. It's like driving a car. You get more skilled over time. But the reality is to your point about fear is you need a healthy dose of fear to keep you in check. So I'm not telling you get rid of all your fears. I'm telling you keep them in control at a healthy dose. It's like a chemistry combination. You need courage. You need some fear. You need some humility. And the combination puts a healthy, healthy growth for everybody. Wow, wow. Wow, that's really, truly inspiring. The bad thing is the time is running very fast. So let's wrap it up. Let's say someone is watching the, this interview and feeling stuck, unfulfilled. What's one piece of advice we can offer today for them to get started with this combination and adding beautiful integrated formula? Thank you. What to have. You've been very awesome and persistent till we made this interview happen. So I'm very grateful to you and to the listeners. And rather than giving an advice, I'm going to give tools. I would like to really see people change. So, so I'm going to offer all your listeners a free e-copy of my book, plus a bunch of downloadable bonuses that include a meditation that I use, all the exercises, copies of my previous book, downloadable stuff. All of that will be available for them to download. They just go to my website, mustafa.com forward slash slingshot. Mustafa is spelled M-O-U-S-T-A-F-A dot -A com forward slash slingshot, like the slingshot. And they're going to put name and email. And in the code, usually they have to put a code that's in the book. But in this case, they just have to put Monday Talks. So we know they are your wow. audience. And if they just put Monday you. Talks, you most welcome. They just put Monday Talks and they will get all of those free downloadables. Amazing. That's really exciting. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. I was going to ask how can viewers be in contact with you, find more details about the ebook, but you surprised me with this. Yeah. Thank you. Really appreciate thank, it. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And thank you for having me on the show. Amazing. So for the closing, thank you so much for joining us today, Mustafa. Really appreciate it after this long time of follow up, but we made it happen. Thank you. This really Thank you. has been a, a very powerful conversation and, and I enjoyed it, really. Thank you. And I, and I want to yeah. remind, and I want to remind all your listeners, you guys are the master of your destiny. Daniel is helping you with amazing content. And I know the fact that you'd listen to people like Daniel and myself means you're on the journey. That's already a step towards mastering your destiny. And hopefully this episode and the bonuses we're giving you are going to help you master your life. Thank you. I have no doubt this will leave uh, a lasting impact to our, um, our viewers. So until next time, keep the passion alive and keep slinging yourselves towards your dreams. Thank you. For our viewers, remember to follow, like, subscribe. Monday Talks is here for you to share more and have more. So stay there and stay tuned. Until next time, stay empowered. Take care. Bye. Thank you.